Hi, this is Heidi Burgess and today I want to talk about overlay issues in conflicts and disputes. In the last video I showed a picture of the Earth and I explained that conflicts are a lot like this diagram, that they have a hot inner core and then there's lots of stuff that gets overlaid over the core, sometimes we call them overlay, sometimes complicating factors, that make the conflict worse and make it difficult even to see what the core is all about. Now on the last slide we said that the core conflict factors tend to be parties' interests and needs, their rights, their moral beliefs and values, high stakes distributional issues, and identity issues. All of these things can get obscured by the five overlay factors, which include factual disagreements, procedural disagreements or discrepancies, framing problems, communication problems, and perhaps the biggest, escalation. I want to explain how those five things play out in the context of the Helsinki summit between Trump and Putin that was held just two days ago in on July 16th. Now I'll say that Guy has warned me that I shouldn't do a video about an event that's going to quickly leave our minds, but I have a strong suspicion that this is going to be front and center and major history for a long time. And some of these slides I hope will show why. First of all, the core of the dispute now is a disagreement over facts, particularly the disagreement over whether or not Russia indeed did meddle in the 2016 election, whether they are doing so now, and who to trust about the assertion that they did or didn't. When Trump was asked if he believed that the U.S. intelligence agencies or Putin were right regarding the accusations, Trump said at the news conference, President Putin says it's not Russia. I don't see any reason why it might would be. He was quickly answered by his director, his hand-picked director of national intelligence, Dan Coates, who pointed out the intelligence community assessments are fact-based. Those are his words. We have been clear in our assessments of Russian meddling in the 2016 election and their ongoing pervasive efforts to undermine our security. These actions are persistent, they are pervasive, and they are meant to undermine American democracy. Yet Trump has repeatedly stated that there's no meddling that there was no meddling in the past and there's no ongoing meddling. So who is right? This is a factual overlay. It leads directly to a variety of ways of framing the situation. Former CIA director, who's a Democrat, John Brennan, calls Trump's statements treasonous. Other Republicans, Jeff Flake, said it's shameful. John McCain said it's disgraceful. Former RNC Chair Michael Steele argued that's how a press conference sounds when an asset stands next to his handler, implying that Trump is a spy or a lackey to Putin and Russia. Senator Lindsey Graham was softer. He simply called it a missed opportunity. Other Republicans who are still supportive of Trump were trying to dismiss it, saying it's Obama's fault because he didn't follow up on the Russian meddling soon enough. It's Russia's fault, saying that we should indeed penalize Russia because they are meddling in the United States democracies, but not calling Trump to task for saying otherwise. Or it's just Trump's ego, but it's no big deal. The argument here being that Trump just didn't want to admit that his election wasn't uh, clean 
And so it was just him covering up and trying to make himself look better, but it's no big deal. President Trump himself framed it di quite differently. He said the meeting between President Putin and myself was a great success, except in the fake news media. And he called his critics haters, who had something that he referred to as the Trump derangement syndrome. Which frame would you say is closer to the truth? Then there's procedures. The procedures for this summit were highly irregular. First of all, Trump didn't use all of the briefing materials he was given. In every other presidential summit, the president's aides prepare massive amounts of material which the president study and they use to base uh, their negotiations. Trump hardly looked at his uh, documents at all. He winged it. And he also insisted that no one was else was present. And there were no recordings made. So nobody knows what went on at this meeting. That's highly irregular. Other procedural disputes go farther back and they're broader. The broad one is one broad one is a relationship between Trump and his US intelligence agencies. Who can he control and who is independent? He tried to control James Comey, who was his head of the FBI. He tried to get him to promise allegiance to Trump. And when Comey refused to do that, insisting that he had allegiance to the US Constitution, Trump fired him. Did he have a right to fire him? That's under dispute. Uh, is the president above the law? That's under dispute. Apparently the Supreme Court nominee that's being considered right now thinks he is. Others think he isn't. Who can the president pardon? Can he pardon any of the people who are up on charges related to the election and possible collusion? Or can he not? Is Mueller's probe, uh, Mueller was assigned to be a special uh, prosecutor after Comey was let go, is his probe legitimate or is it, as Trump says, a witch hunt? That's a framing question. It's also a procedural dispute or a f procedural overlay problem. Then there's communication overlays and the one that's being talked about at the moment is what Trump said and what he now says he meant. He said, my people came to me. Dan Coates came to me and some others. They said they think it's Russia. I have President Putin. He just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. That's what he said on the 16th in Helsinki. Later, he said he misspoke. He left out the word not. I don't see any reason why it would not be Russia. So he tried to back down after he got all the negative reaction from even from his own party and said that he left out the word not, but then he quickly reverted and again asserted that there wasn't meddling, there wasn't collusion, and he didn't do anything wrong. Another uh, communication issue is whether or not we should be calling this treason. As I said before, John Brennan, the former CIA director, said it was. His quote, Donald Trump's press conference performance in Helsinki rises to and exceeds the threshold of high crimes and mis misdemeanors. It was nothing short of treasonous. Not only were Trump's comments imbecilic, he is wholly in the pocket of Putin. Republican patriots, where are you? But one Republican patriot, uh, a former Bush advisor, now professor at Johns Hopkins, uh, Elliot Cohen, said the word treason is so strong that we must use it carefully. But that press conference has brought the President of the United States right up to that dark 
dark shore. So we have to use our words very carefully. And I predict there's going to be a lot of talk over the next weeks, months, maybe years, as to whether or not this previous and future acts are or are not treason. And then going back to procedural disputes, what to do about that. Perhaps the most damaging overlay factor is escalation. The relationships between the two parties now is more escalated than anyone pretty much has ever remembered. Scholars Pruitt, Rubin, and Kim some years ago wrote a book called Social Conflict, Escalation, Stalemate, and Settlement where they lay out a number of factors that led to and were uh, typical of escalation. Tactics went from light to heavy, going from trying to persuade the other side or negotiate with, to, with the other side to using coercion, power plays, even violence. The size of the conflict increases, meaning that there's more parties, there's more issues, and there's more resources being devoted to the conflict. Issues go from specific to general until it's just a matter of the other side being evil and wrong in everything that they do and think and are. And goals doing from wanting to do well, even if the other side does well too, to winning, to eventually, in highly escalated conflicts, you get to the point where the main goal is to hurt the other. And I really think that's where we are now. Let's look at this for a minute. You've got tactics that are extremely harsh. Both sides are attacking each other in every way they can manage to do, short usually of violence, and there's even been some instances of that. Enormous numbers of resources are getting devoted to this conflict. We certainly have gotten to the general point where each side views the other with deep distrust and hatred. The issues have proliferated, we're fighting over everything and our goals have gotten to the point where we're trying very hard to beat the other side into oblivion. I call this in other places the end of the sea syndrome. We're trying to drive the opponents into the sea rather than work with them in any way. You can put this in a conflict map and you start seeing arrows, meaning that one thing leads to the other. So heavy tactics lead to oppositional goals on the other side, which then leads to heavy tactics back. Uh, the issues proliferate, the parties involved proliferate, and everything feeds back upon itself. Then you can add in the other overlays, the fake facts, the questionable procedures, the miscommunication, or in this case, even the propaganda, the differential framing, and you start getting feedback loops throughout the entire system. Practically everything increases the intensity of everything else and the spiral goes up faster and faster and gets pulls in more and more people and does more and more damage. And all of this is overlaying the core conflict factors which we can't even see and we're not even paying any attention to anymore. We're just trying to do in the other side. And that's why overlays are so damaging and so important. We'll talk about what to do about all of these in the coming videos. Thanks.